Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Lubkeman. I have the privilege of being the head of foresight at the ETH at Zurich. And I'm very, very happy to welcome you to today's lecture towards gender equity on the occasion of today's International Women's Day. The ETH Global Lecture Series offers a platform for contemporary global topics to be discussed with outstanding global thinkers. Each month, we bring two amazing people together to discuss their personal insights, experiences, and expertise. In addition to simply learning, our goals here are to broaden our perspectives of the contemporary issues so that we can all expand our thinking, challenge our opinions, and through this, make a more meaningful contribution to issues which we are all working on. This day, as I've already said, marks the International Women's Day which is why I'm especially honored for me to be able to host this conversation between two incredible people. We have Professor Iris Bonet, Dean of the Harvard Kennedy School, behavioral economic, excuse me, a behavioral economist and expert on diversity and gender equality. Author of an award-winning book, of many award-winning books, but the one we're gonna be talking about a lot here today what works, gender equality by design, and is no stranger to the ETH Zurich, as we were very, very, very lucky to have her give a lecture here in 2017 about unconscious bias. Her discussion partner will be Professor Sarah Springman, rectorin of the ETH Zurich, an award-winning athlete, a person who holds many firsts to her name here, and a steadfast advocate of general, of general of gender equality. Our time together will be 60 minutes. I will start our dialogue and then you, our audience, will have the possibility to ask questions by using the Q&A button at any time. You pop them in there and we will hold them. I will incorporate as many of your questions into our discussion as possible. I can't promise we'll get to all of them, but we will do our very best because one hour is like a drop in the bucket for this topic. So, are we ready? Iris, Absolutely. Sarah, welcome to you both. Absolutely. Iris, Iris thanks you so much for having us. And you're 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 zooming into us from Boston, if I'm not mistaken, Cambridge. That's correct. Yes, Chris. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you. And Sarah, I see you are flying in a hot air balloon above our lovely Zurich. I love it. I absolutely love it. Where I spent 18 years being a proper professor before I took over my current job. Well, it's, it's great to have you both here. So Iris, I'd like to start with you. You wrote the book, Gender Equality by Design. What does that phrase mean to you today? Well, it still means kind of the same thing it did when I, when I wrote it, um, that we kind of collectively have to come together to advance gender equality or gender equity as we tend to focus a bit more on today. Um, and, but, and of course, this is a particularly important year for Switzerland because lots to celebrate, even though we weren't the first country out of the gate, um, we have to acknowledge, but uh, women did get the right to vote 50 years ago. So that's what I am working on, trying to bring uh, research insights to bear on closing gender gaps, whether that's in economic participation, in political participation, health or education, or really any other area uh, of our society. That's fantastic, thank you. And Sarah, what about for you? What does that mean for you? I think it's absolutely, absolutely huge, the, the 50 years since the, the voting. I think for me, um, what's really exciting is to look back on um, 24 years in Switzerland so far, and what it was like when I first came and how much it has changed. And there's been, there've been bigger jumps and there've been incremental improvements. And for me, this is, a, this, is, this is absolutely massive. And it's lovely to be able to talk about it on this special day. You know, it's a, I remember the, the statements, it's bread for the women, but roses too. We need both bread and roses too. This has always been something that's been important to me. That's great. Well, I like both, and I think I'm really glad that we can have both. So, so Iris, I know you have a um, a method which you you like to help us understand. It's called impact, if I recall correctly. Could you explain hmm. what is what is impact? I mean, I, I know what the word means, but I think you have a, you have a lot of other meanings for it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, maybe let me take a step back. Um, so what I am trying to do is to focus, in fact, on systemic change rather than on changing individuals. As you said, Chris, I'm a behavioral economist by training. Um, and I actually came to gender somewhat late, about a dozen years ago or so. I was asked to one of our research centers, and I had done a little bit on gender, but really focused on many other topics uh, that a behavioral economist might focus on. And I realized then that, in fact, the toolkit that I uh, have used to de-bias um, organizations beforehand um, could easily be applied to questions of gender equality or more generally diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so uh, we have also learned as behavioral scientists that it's, in fact, really hard to de-bias mindsets. Uh, mm -hmm. People tend to be pretty stubborn beasts in many ways. Um, and uh, a lot of the biases actually have crept into our organizations in how we hire, how we promote the procedures, the practices. And so that's what we focus on um, in our research. And so the impact that you just mentioned is in fact an acronym that we use here at the Kennedy School at Harvard, uh, where I work, where we try to give this a bit of framework, the work that we're doing here to uh, uh, level the playing field for everyone. And it's a bit broader than just gender equality. It really is about um, inclusion broadly. So the I in impact uh, stands for insight. So, you know, we are obviously in an academic context at the ETH or uh, um, at Harvard. And so good work starts with some insights into what the issue is. So we might also want to call this diagnosis, really understanding what's happening. Um, and so, so we do quite a bit of, uh, uh, quite a number of programs just focusing on uh, people's awareness on unconscious bias, but also, for example, bystander trainings so we can get better to combat the sexual harassment at work and at school. So that's the I. The M in impact stands for measurement. Uh, what doesn't get measured doesn't count. That's also true for uh, gender equality, diversity, equity, and inclusion more generally. Uh, so we now publish our diversity statistics. Um, uh, we started uh, doing that a few years ago. So we are transparent about, about what's happening, but also we hold ourselves accountable and see how we're doing over time. Uh, we also measure some other things, um, inclusion, people's experiences um, uh, at Harvard. The P stands for policy, uh, policy practices and procedures. That's particularly close to my heart because much change happens, as I mentioned before, through systemic change. So we focus quite a bit on how we hire, how we promote the faculty and HR, of course, is one of uh, the responsibilities that I have. So that's been um, uh, quite, quite a focus of mine. And then A stands for access. Uh, we know that inequities in the past keep people from accessing the resources, the education that we have to offer. So financial support, other types of access measures are there. Culture, that's the C in impact. Uh, it is important to focus on formal procedures, but we have to go beyond the formal and also understand people's experiences. And then finally, the T is for tools. Uh, so that's the impact framework, but let me give you one example of a toolkit that I'm a big fan of. So Great. some colleagues of mine, have developed a, a simple toolkit to measure participation in the classroom. And, uh, and you know, it's a little bit of technology. I mean, I'm at the right place, of course, to talk about technology, just a little bit of technology, which makes it easier for all professors uh, to in fact call on people equitably. And I, just to end with that, I'll give you a personal example. When I used a tool to see how well I was doing, I realized that I was discriminating against people on the right-hand side of the room. Now, this wasn't a political statement on my part, but it actually <laughs> had something to do, um, yeah. hmm. It had something to do with my hearing. Hmm. Uh, I don't hear well in my right ear. Uh -huh. So I subconsciously you know, didn't pay attention to the right-hand uh, side of the room quite as much. Huh. And I'm giving this as an example because that's how many of these biases creep in, sure. right? Not intentionally, but unconsciously. And what I now do just to end with that story, I try to stand on the right hand side of the room normally. Uh -huh. So kind of everyone is on my left. Yeah, but that's really fantastic here is how you said, you know, that even someone who, as yourself, who's so focused and aware of this as a bigger issue could 
discover through this tool, through this assessment, something that you weren't aware. This is the unconscious bias and, and how to, and then it's great that you said, okay, I'm gonna correct this. I'm gonna do what I can to correct this. So you made an effort, right? Is that, it's like, you know, making an effort because change only starts if you start to make the effort. Yeah. So Sarah. That's right, Chris. I also, Chris, just one more word on that. Sure. I also made it e easier. To, I think it's important for our listeners to see what the effort kind of entails. I also made it easier for me mm -hmm. to get this right. Right. So it, it's very hard to think about these types of issues every moment of the day. In fact, we shouldn't sure. and we cannot do that. Sure. And so therefore, we need to find those types of crutches, which make it easier for us and to get things right. Yeah. That's really great. I mean, you're not, not saying it's less important. It's actually even more important than the easy finding, the easy way to. It's like you, you don't run a marathon without the right shoes, or maybe depends on the culture. Sometimes you don't you run it without shoes. So that, that's the wrong metaphor. Okay, I'll, I'll take that one back. So Sarah, what about shoes? So impact is insights, measurement, policy, practice, procedures, access, culture, tools. What does that make you think I about? love it. I love it. I'm going to I'm going to pick up on something that Iris was talking about to do with young girls. We have actually a gender, very interesting gender situation in Switzerland, and there is a gap of seven percent in the annual cohort of, uh, of of between the two genders of kids going to the gymnasium. And yes, you guessed it. There are more women than there are men. And so this is fascinating. And you would instantly think, well, inevitably, that means at ETH, we will have more female students than male students. Clearly, um, the percentage of women doing mint subjects is actually a bit less than 50%, but we sort of sit on around about 30%. And what we also know is, on average, the girls get better um, average marks in their matura than the boys. So you would imagine the transfer across to ETH would be easy, but it's not, because it's a question of culture. It is exactly that. It's culture, it's self-confidence, it's how these kids have learned at school. And if there's a little bit of more, so um, parrot learning or whatever, and there's concept learning, the boys have tended to be able to be quite good at the concept learning. The girls have wanted to try and be able to re repeat everything. So when they first come to us, we do concept tests and the, and the young men perform, outperform the young women. And they also do that in our selection examination at the end of the first year, because we can't choose our students like Harvard. We have to select them out at the end of the first year. And so um, what we find, and there's two term, two chances to do it. So again, depending a bit on the subject their stuff, their, 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 their studying, in general, in the hard engineering, it's, it, the women sometimes need to have a second, a second chance, which possibly, hmm. if they'd been blokes, they wouldn't have done. So there's that confidence, there's that ability to think in concept, and then they catch up, and sometimes they go sailing past. But it's exactly what I saw at Cambridge when I was a student, the... the British Cambridge, it's, uh, the, 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 the women, young women went with a much steeper gradient because of this loss of confidence, this lack of ability to just transfer in the different cultures across to the two. So we measure it like mad, and that gives us insight into how we change our policies. So with the splitting the, the first year examinations in two bits and so So I use this a lot. Um, and uh, now I know the term impact, I'll know how to, how to rephrase it. That's really great. Thank you for that. So, and here's, you, you have been focusing a lot also on what works to enhance equality, right? So this is what I say, as a researcher, what works? Because, you know, you need to, we, we need to know um, from impact. Well, can, give us some, like, can you share us some things that you've observed that work and yeah. maybe some things that don't work? You know? So <clears throat> first of all, Chris, we actually have, we, when I say we, I mean, we economists have been borrowing a methodology that has been much more prevalent in the natural sciences for many, many decades, in fact, and that's randomized controlled trials or clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And most of your students probably all are familiar with that. You have a control group, you have a treatment group, and you give some the placebo and others um, the treatment, and then you measure what difference difference makes. And that's, in fact, the tool, the technology, the method, methodology of choice for us economists as well to establish causality. And right, that's your question. We have to know whether A in fact led to B or whether C in fact led to B. 
And that's what we're trying to do with organizations. And that in itself is a bit of a mind shift. Many organizations, not just in the uh, gender equality space uh, or the diversity, equity, inclusion space, but more generally, have often just been copying each other, sometimes called best practice. So I'm looking over my shoulders um, and I see what my competitor is doing. And if they do a diversity training program or a mentoring program or have uh, uh, employee uh, resource groups, then I'm just going to do that as well because my competitor is doing it. And we have rarely, in fact, used the rigor. That, of course, uh, is also a core pillar for the ETH in, um, in your uh, scholarship and in your education. And, and so that's when we come in. So we try to convince organizations that, in fact, there is no silver bullet, although I'll give you some generalized insights in a moment, but that they should really use that kind of rigor in their HR departments that they also use in their uh, research departments, in mm. their finance departments, and sometimes even in their marketing departments. You know, it's just, it was amazing to me that we have, in fact, A-B tested. We might not call it a clinical trial or a randomized control trial, but close enough, you know, the color of the shampoo, you know, does it resonate with our customers or not? And, but we haven't done anything of that sort, for example, with our job advertisements. So it starts with relatively simple, low-hanging fruit, such as how we go out into the market. What are we telling uh, the market? What types of employees are we looking for? Hmm. And now we have, of course, the technology, a little bit of machine learning, um, uh, a bit of AI, where we can, in fact, predict how likely men and women are to apply to a given job, given hmm. the language that is used. Hmm. And many, many organizations now use those wow. tools to de-bias yeah. the language that is used in job ads. So that's um, pretty generalizable, again, low-hanging fruit that we all can learn from. But, you know, of course, it's every uh, uh, text that you can imagine. So imagine hmm. uh, letters of recommendation. Uh, I'm hmm. sure you and Sarah have seen some of the same patterns that sometimes, uh, sadly, our women faculty get shorter letters or get letters with more feminine stereotyped adjectives. You know, she's a hard worker, while the male colleague is a visionary thinker. So we have to do better at devising simple things, such as how we communicate, how we speak, how we write, uh, how we write those letters, how we write our job ads. But that's just one example. But you know, we can go um, into organizations, get into much more detail on the hiring, the promotion, performance appraisals, uh, and, and even how you run a meeting. So do you, let me just ask you very quickly before Sarah, I think you're you're itching to respond, just two, two seconds. I, I, I loved how you said you can, you as you as you understood your bias with the, the siding of your lecture hall, can, this is something which groups can learn to do. You can, de can you de-bias a group? Or is it so hard? I mean, what's your experience with that show? Is it yeah. is it possible, or is it just like, oh, come on, it's a it's a, it's a uphill battle. We're never going to win. Yeah. So, so raising awareness itself is not going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it rarely does. It shouldn't surprise us. It's rarely true yeah. that just knowing something is going to lead us to exercise more or eat more healthily, right? There's other issues in our lives where we might have virtuous intentions and then we don't get around to doing it. And sometimes I describe the work that we're now describing on diversity, equity and inclusion and gender equality specifically as a bit in that category, that there are many, many, many good people, increasingly many good people with good intentions. And then in the heat of the moment, we don't give credit to the person who made um, the comment. So that's mm. now a you know, specific question that many women I'm sure in our audience will have experienced mm. that you are in a meeting, you are even in a lecture hall sometimes in a seminar and you make a comment and then 10 minutes later, a male colleague makes some, a very similar comment and then he is given credit mm. for the comment. And then, you know, how do we that? How do we overcome that? That's really, really hard to do in the moment. So for meetings, uh, for example, what works really well is to have um, a devil's advocate or somebody you know, assigned who has the role 
to watch out for these types of micro inequities, which just creep in all the time. And then that person can easily bring it back to the original uh, commentator and say, love your comment, um, John, but uh, you know, it's it, it really important. And I'm so happy you were building on what Jane mentioned earlier. In fact, I think we might have moved uh, a bit quickly um, from what Jane was saying, and then you can bring it back to Jane. That's a brilliant idea. I've never heard of it. That's absolutely really cool. I love that. Sarah. Yeah, I, I'm going to come in on that and say, well, we, we have the gender and diversity advocates now who sit on these profess professorial appointment committees. And our president, Joel Mezo, has given these GDAs a, a really serious job to make sure that they sit there in the meeting and they keep notes and they report to him afterwards. And then when all of the papers are presented to him and to me and to Detlef Gunter, our vice president for research, we see all of that. And I absolutely read every single word because I read all of the the uh, the minutes and I read the, the, the gender and diversity um, advocates report. And I think that's really very, very helpful. And um, it's a step in the right direction. But I want to come back on this business about uh, Iris, about, the, um, about the, the websites and the language that we're using. We have at ETH three study areas where we have more female students than males. It's in the health sciences, it's in the environmental sciences, and in, in biology. And there are a few that are sort of pushing up their architecture, chemistry, interestingly, in pharmacy, um, are, are then the next in behind. And of course, we lag behind madly in mechanical, electrical, and uh, engineering and computer sciences. Okay, so what do we do about that? And is it the image that people have in their minds as young people about what is an engineer? How can we change that? Can we change the language on the website so that it's more inclusive? And so this was one of the things that I I tried to encourage my colleagues mm. to think about when I first came on board. And I also meet regularly. In fact, tonight, I think I'm meeting the women's societies. And, um, and we talk a lot about this. And so from the students' level, they do a little bit of activism at their level to also to challenge, to say, this is how we get more young women interested to come and be like us, to come and study here. So I, I think there's a lot of things we can do in terms of the language that makes it more, more accessible again. And going out in the schools, sending out our young female students, as well as our young male students to go and visit the schools, especially the schools they come from, makes it, oh, I can do that. And that's an important thing, especially for uh, young women and sometimes also vulnerable young men as well. Sarah, I completely agree with that in that seeing is believing. If you don't see somebody like you uh, mm -hmm. in you. a part, particular job, right, mm -hmm. um, then you you don't think that that's a possibility for you. So I love I love that you're doing that. Yes. Mm -hmm. In addition, Chris, maybe if I can mention, I mean, you know, I'm an economist, so the numbers in econ aren't so different. In fact, uh, in that we only have about thirty percent women in economics as well, and uh, we we're now experimenting also with different ways of teaching. It turns out that we also have to try hard to meet the people where they are when they enter university. And, you know, many uh, young people, for example, associate econ maybe more with finance or with macroeconomics or with some, you know, something quite abstract, when in fact, there are education economists, there's social policy, there's development economics, there, there's just lots of topics that many of our students, environmental economics, of course, is a huge one, that many of our uh, young students deeply care about, independent of the gender now, but we're also thinking hard about even, you know, what are we communicating with the way we teach during the first year? Are we scaring people away? Are we, you know, too heavily focused on the uh, techniques um, rather than maybe the substance? So we're trying to counterbalance that a bit, and that has helped as well. Oh. Let me, I would like to back up a half a step or maybe one and come back to the culture question. As a researcher, and both of you are interact with many different aspects of research. And you said, we have to, if you don't measure, et cetera. But what would you suggest here is from the research are some of the most important factors when it comes to their, the culture of place or the culture of the institution the culture of the students and the follow to that, are you seeing any evolution in, in this or observation of evolution with a cultural change? 
Specifically, Chris, do you think about our universities or more generally in society? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, so spe specifically at universities. Both. I mean, or both, actually, both here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean, first of all, I think Sarah and I would both agree numbers do matter. Uh, so yeah. we have the fraction of women uh, who's, who uh, go to university who do a tertiary degree has definitely increased. Um, mm -hmm. Even though, Sarah, I also agree with uh, your observation before, you know, it, it, the gap, in fact, is reversed in the beginning. And then all of a sudden, um, people start to enter the labor market, and then the gap kind of increases again, and we're losing women somehow. So that's what we have to worry about. But in terms of you know education, if you look at um, the World Bank data or the World Economic Forum data, that initial gender gap in education, where men tended to be better educated than women, has in fact closed in many countries and reverse, uh, in particular in some developing countries, and also in some countries of the Middle East, where we wouldn't even you know, maybe maybe spontaneously look, but so I think on education, uh, a lot has happened. We still have, uh, of course, the segregation that Sarah talked about before. That we have, you know, more women studying psychology and law than men, and we have more men studying mechan mechanical engineering or computer science, um, and that, of course, is something that I think we have to work on. But these. Yes, so these numbers do matter. Seeing is believing. Critical mass is important. It's really hard to be the only one in a classroom. It's mm. really one to, it, mm. it you know, doesn't have to be um, gender necessarily, but it's the only one of difference. Um, and it then you very often are uh, tokenized, you call this. So taken as a representative of your gender. And the professor might even say, oh, and ears. What did you think about, you know, uh, how do women feel about this? And, and that, of course, is unhelpful. So, so I think in that sense, that culture has changed. And our institutions are also, I think, uh, seeing it more as their responsibility uh, to make sure that the labor market, in fact, can uh, benefit from 100% of the talent pool. And that is part of our responsibility to enable everyone um, to thrive and uh, offer their amazing talents uh, to the world. And, and so in that sense, yes. So things are changing. They're changing slowly, Chris. I do, I, you know, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think for too long, we have uh, treated gender equality as a luxury good, as mm. a nice to have, mm. you know, add on and, you know, a, a lovely thing to do rather than a necessity or something that we are in fact deeply uh, passionate about and yeah. committed to. And so I think yeah. we're just at that verge now yeah. where I'm seeing uh, many more institutions um, like the ITAR, MIT or Harvey Mudd College, for example, uh, in the US now has 50% women in their computer science um, classes really focused on, on understanding, yeah. diagnosing, you know, going with, with the inside diagnosing What's actually happening? Is it happening? When is it happening? Is yeah. it happening in kindergarten? Is it happening at school? Is it happening in our gymnasiums? Is it happening when they enter university? At which point um, are we starting to lose some of the talent and how can we adjust? And I think yeah. that is a very important move to take the responsibility on our shoulders yeah. rather than on the individual shoulders and just say, oh, you know, bad luck. You apparently didn't get it. Yeah. Sarah, I know this is something which is bringing very close to your heart as well, and you have observed over the past, say, 10, 20, almost 30 years with your career in academia, how this has changed and the actual applications and the treatment of the different genders has changed. Mm. What, what would you say, I mean, how, how, do you, how do you observe that, with, especially with technical? Well, I think it's just go back to civil engineering. When I first came here 24 years ago, there was about 5% of the class um, were, were, were young women, and you had to really look to see them. And all of a sudden, uh, about 10 years later, we were at about 15%. And I asked them, what do you need? What do you think we need in the schools to do in the schools? And, and for you, 
to give you more support as young uh, female students um, wanting to study civil engineering. He said, well, you know, do you need more female professors? Do you need more female assistants, you no know, doctoral students? Oh, you know, we sort of ex assume that's going to be happening. The most important thing for them was, was the peer group and was there a sufficient critical mass? And so mm. that's again, simply reinforcing what Iris is saying. And that goes all the way across the, the board. They want people like them to be in their group. And of course they love interacting with the with the, the guys as well as the but it's all part and parcel of it and that's what's really important i think what's really interesting switzerland and iris you know being a, a swiss i'm swiss now too by the way but being swiss uh, <laughs> by, by but um you would have understood um what it was like uh what it was like um all of those all of those years ago and um and 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 i feel very strongly that the young Swiss who now are coming to do bachelors and masters and who are accepting that there are lots of other people coming through from the Fachhochschule, the, the best students, the Fachhochschule come and study with us. We have lots of students from all around the world who come here, they come on a mobility visit, all of this stuff. They are really so much more open than I think perhaps they were. And the university is much more open than when I came and all the professors were hair professor, doctor, and you had to use all three. Whereas, <laughs> whereas you know, and, and, and very quickly within a month, I was like the top level, I'm Sarah, then the next level down a month later and all of that. I didn't need a title in order to have authority. I wanted to get everybody to think and work together because if you were limited by my brain, we weren't going to get very far. So, I, you know, it's a, different, it's a different style and it was a more international style. And now we've gone from having had 30% um, uh, foreign professors when I first arrived and a much smaller group of professors. And most of that 30% came from Germany. So again, slightly similar <laughs> cultures. Nowadays, we're at 70% uh, foreign professors. And a lot of them have come back. They've been Europeans coming back from the States. So they're coming in with an Anglo-Saxon sort of thinking style. And, and, you know, it's become so much more open. And it really, I think, is quite exciting. And then we talk about other aspects of diversity, you know, LGBT and all of these things. This is growing. And the younger generation are much more open than we were. And it's much easier um, to be open about all of those things as well. So I think... There are lots of positive things I'd like to say, um, as well as the ongoing challenges. And I think we've made significant improvement in my time here anyway. Well, let me ask you, so this is a question which has come in, which I find, th thank you for that, Sarah, that's really great. Uh, there's a question which has come in, which is kind of intriguing, saying, so has, we've all been now in uh, distance learning and we've mm -hmm. been in this sort of COVID and research is showing that women, in many parts of the world have taken a really hard hit as far as bearing an, an extraordinary burden mm -hmm. for this. Um, this new this new home quote home office, home life. Has to, ha, what can, can you tell us the positive and the negative aspects of distance learning when it comes to gender equality? Uh, are there any observations which either of you are making on this? So I'm going to start with the positive. Uh, we actually have found that uh, participation is more equal uh, mm -hmm. online than in the room. Mm -hmm. And I can't say we have done enough research to really understand why that's happening. Yeah. Uh, partly, it might be that, you know, clicking kind of raise your hand feels maybe more immediate, feels different, might also give you a bit more time to in fact know when it is your turn, you kind of see the list of people who have, you know, have their mm -hmm. virtual hands up. Uh, sometimes it is maybe smaller environments, maybe the professors have changed and are trying harder, maybe they're seeing it, you know, it's more in your face when you have these whatever 24 people in the seminar on your screen and you kind of, you have a better sense geographical way of kind of calling on everyone. I don't know. But participation has been a very good thing. And the chat, while sometimes, I mean, uh, when I teach, I find it hard, you know, to teach and um, share my slides and pay attention <laughs> to the chat yep. and the raise yep. hands and everything. But the chat um, also has enabled people to contribute in different mm. ways where you might not have mm. to speak up. You can just type in um, a commentary. And yeah. so, so I think that's uh, all good. And I 
I don't know what you would say, Sarah, but we actually have been surprised mm. by how well the teaching went. Um, yep. I mean, not immediately, it was tough last spring a year ago, and it's hard mm. to say, right? We're like, mm. it, we're now uh, about a year into this. Uh, actually, at Harvard, we shut down on March 16th, so it's pretty much a year ago. And, um, but so I think we, we got better. And I think our pedagogy, in fact, is also more intentional. I certainly hmm. now, I feel that I have to plan my, my class in a much more intentional way. Hmm. Um, and, you know, because you anyway had to plan it more intentionally because it was a new, new technology and you kind of had to figure it out. And so I think many people want to actually keep some of what they've learned now uh, when we are back in person. So I think that's all good. What our students report, uh, what they miss most, is not the pedagogy, not what they learn on the screen, but in fact, social interactions. I mean, mm -hmm. again, I'm not sharing a secret here. <laughs> um, yeah. It's obvious to every to everyone. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that is really hard for mm -hmm. our students. Uh, that's yeah. a big part of, of learning. I mean, collective sure. learning, engaging each other, but also just having a bit of fun um, at that time in your life. And have you noticed yours before Sarah comes in have you noticed any difference in the expression of the of the, the frustration or the pain or the hardship between your the different genders within the Harvard School? Yeah. So in our surveys, uh, we have actually not found um, big gender differences. Mm -hmm. uh, where we do find differences is between caregivers and non-caregivers. So oh, yeah. some of our students and the older students have already have children. Yeah. And that's been extremely hard, of course, yeah. that the caregiving at home. And we also know that, of course, we haven't closed the gender gap at home yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yet. Mm -hmm. That's often mm -hmm. still a black box. Yep. And yep. women have done more of the caregiving. Mm -hmm. um, so it's these, it's, it's these students and also students who, of course, work in environments uh, where they mm -hmm. can't, in fact, study from home. Yeah. So we have found huge socioeconomic mm -hmm. issues. So at the Kennedy School, 50% mm -hmm. of our students are from outside of the U.S. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and But also within the U.S. It's not just mm -hmm. outside, but also within the U.S. The time zones are a huge mm -hmm. challenge. Um, and then just a work environment that yeah. you have if you live in a house with 10 other people. Sure. It's mm -hmm. just really, really hard. Um, and, yeah. and in that sense, um, the pandemic has, in fact, mm -hmm. and maybe that is the biggest takeaway of the pandemic, and certainly for the U.S., has increased um, yep. uh, differences in opportunity that yes. were existing before. And that's not primarily yep. gender, but that's socioeconomic. Yeah. yeah, and the same thing if they don't have the really good internet links, they're sharing a room with their younger sibling. All of this stuff is really, really very tough. And if they're called upon by the family also to care um, it, it, uh, for older or younger generation, that's really difficult. I, I would simply reinforce exactly what Iris has said all the way through. We almost uh, a mirror image of what we found uh, of what we found as well. We have um, some mental health challenges. That's a, a, a big issue. Um, I'm not sure that that's a, a gender divided issue, but gen in general terms, this is something. So we're running a mental health campaign, to talk about it. And just and we're emphasizing very clearly where the places are to go at each different level so that um, students can identify and say we do a stress test, they can do a self-assessment and all of that to try and help people to talk about it before it gets to the final awful step. If one was to commit suicide or do something awful like that. And this is the biggest nightmare of any rector is that you lose a student um, in, the, in that way. Um, one of the things that I found has been really interesting, Iris, about we had lunch today with some of the uh, assistant professors and some of our other female professors to celebrate International Women's Day, which was lovely. Mm -hmm. And what our assistant professors tell us that, um, you know, with spending more time at home, having to do the home caring, the homeschooling, inevitably, probably they might carry a little bit more of the load of running the house. Um, Teaching is taking more time, guess what, in order to get it right. All of the things you said I absolutely support. So what does that mean? Is there's less time for them, for their mental health or to keep fit, and there's less time for their research. So do they then take another year and they say this is a COVID year, when last year they also had a baby year as well. So how do we manage that? And how do we make sure that our colleagues who are sitting in these uh, in these commissions and who are writing references for young female assistant professors hoping for tenure, that this is taken account of, that people focus on quality and not quantity. And I think these are really, really important points that we need to make people aware 
uh, aware of because quite often some of my colleagues, I'm absolutely exhausted. I'm absolutely exhausted. And, and you know, almost breaking down into, in, into tears and whatever. And you think, oh my goodness. And so we as senior people need to put a proverbial arm out to say, well, do you want to talk about it? Can I help you? What can I do to, to assist? And I think that is, you know, you get to the edge and it's whether you go, you fall off it or whether you can fly, whether you can fly again. And I think that's what, what we have to do is to make it possible um, so that that happens. So I totally hear you, Sarah. And, and in light of that, there's one, one question came in or asking around. So what are some of the things that we could, should, must be doing? Some other, are there some of the little things? You've mentioned a couple of areas on some of the words and you have, and, and I think there's a tool which you suggested we could take, we could use to see, but are there uh, someone said, so in, in, in my everyday, what can I do on a daily basis to make a positive impact of the position of women? Mm. That, it's a really good question. Um, so uh, I would encourage uh, everyone who is joining us today to become a micro sponsor for somebody else. Hmm. And what, what I mean with that is, in fact, that you lift somebody else up and make it today your first day where you lift somebody up, but don't just do it on International Women's Day. And this is not gendered specifically. You can mm -hmm. lift anyone up, mm -hmm. but uh, think back of my example of the meeting where people are overlooked or people are interrupted. People mm -hmm. aren't given credit um, for the work. And in fact, just going back to uh, our academic discussion before Sarah, I mean, some of the research also shows that women as co-authors are getting less credit mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. male uh, men as co-authors. So mm -hmm. it's really, really bad. That's mm -hmm. very rigorous research by a former doctor mm -hmm. student of mine um, focusing on econ. Mm -hmm. uh, we find that women are more likely to be interrupted when they give mm -hmm. job talks in seminars. And mm -hmm. so it, yep. you know, it really is everywhere. So that's why we need more people like mm -hmm. everyone who's joining us today who own this, right? Mm -hmm. We can have the diversity advocate, Sarah, mm -hmm. that you and I have in your yep. uh, meetings, uh, the devil's advocate, that's a very good mm -hmm. thing. But we all have to be those micro sponsors. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's much easier you know, for mm -hmm. me to jump in and bring it back mm -hmm. to somebody, right? I can bring mm -hmm. it back to Jane. Um, even mm -hmm. if I don't have a formal role there, mm -hmm. but I can do it politely, inclusively. I don't have mm -hmm. to embarrass John. You know, again, the way I just yeah. described it before, um, I can celebrate John and lift up Jane at mm -hmm. the same time. So mm -hmm. become a micro sponsor. I, I would add, I would, I think that's absolutely lovely. I would add to that. One of my areas in my, in my past, I was a triathlete, right? And I was a moderately successful triathlete. I won a few things, but I think I found more wings later on when I became an advocate for, for, for women and for our athletes. And I wrote the first um, women's action plan for the sport of triathlon. And the words that we used was uh, a quality of opportunity. Did you have the chance? Recognition. Did somebody actually give you the chance to stand on the podium and have the same chance as the men to be on the podium and all the rest of it with the flags and the anthems? And did you get the same reward? Because I've got so many hair dryers that I got round the back of the bike sheds for winning a race in the early days when the men were getting a check and were being fated and all the rest of it. So, but for women in triathlon, that happens to be the sport with the men. So by not taking the radical point of view that we wanted to do, but as it were, putting our arms around the guys and saying, come on, help us to do this. You know, this is right. And, and our sport was from a very early, early on, equal prize money uh, and equal numbers of spaces at Olympic Games and all of that. So I, I often think about that equality of opportunity, recognition and reward just to check back on whether or not I'm doing all three, because actually you need to do that. And you probably as an academic will tell me, Sarah, you forgot about this. Okay, well, in that case, I'll include the new uh, Iris bit into, into my quality of opportunity. <laughs> uh, but, but something like that, where you're thinking about that and all bits are relevant in, in, a, in, a, in a small way. So you've got to be there to win it and to be celebrated. It sounds like, yeah. go ahead, yeah. Iris, sorry. I, I think that's lovely, Sarah, also that you point out, sorry, sorry, Chris, but I have to jump in on the reward for a second, because of course what you're saying, Sarah, is so, I mean, it has broader implications. And we, we know that that's not true for 
all sports here, uh, you know, in the US, the women's <laughs> soccer team uh, is pressing charges because they were compensated less. And it's particularly yes. funny in the US. I mean, I'm, I'm saying funny in quotation marks. Title nine. Um, Title nine. Soccer is, in fact, a female sport, right? Yes, Title nine, but also soccer is a female sport in the US, right? The women's soccer okay. team is so much better than the men's soccer team. So you can't even justify it um, with commercial terms, um, so it's, it's the whole thing. But I just wanted to quickly shine a light on this question of reward. Uh, I mean, that's another thing that you, um, you know, our young people, but, but everyone here has to be vigilant about um, equal pay um, for equal work. And uh, I think this pandemic, going back to the pandemic, also now, of course, has um, made realize that uh, what we now call essential work is heavily undercompensated mm -hmm. and often um, over proportionally mm -hmm. um, supplied by women. Mm -hmm. And so we should also look to other countries such as New Zealand, which is now focusing not just on equal pay for equal work, mm -hmm. but for, uh, to equal pay for work of equal value. So mm -hmm. think of, you know, nurses. Why do nurses make oh. so much such less in the US than, for mm -hmm. example, correction officers? So, mm -hmm. so that I think triggers a very new discussion of how we value the work that people supply. I think that's absolutely fascinating. And I, I, I'm quite sure it needs people like you here is to be able to try and put a better value on because I would be as a civil engineer, I would be completely out of my depth at how you but I was absolutely disgusted, excuse me just for saying this. I'm very rarely critical in, 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 in public. I was absolutely disgusted that the nurses in Great Britain got a 1% pay rise. When you see how many billions um, the government, um, you know, I'm also still British as well, wasted on all sorts of appalling uh, policies and all the rest of it. And I just, I'm absolutely horrified and disgusted. And I think this is something that we really should be doing, Iris. I, I have my own micro system within ETH that I look within my own area and where I have information. And my fellow colleagues on the executive board will know that I challenge on a number of occasions on little micro things from time to time, I ask questions because I think it's important that we, we do that and we move towards something that is um, uh, approaching um, equal pay for equal work but it, it's quite a difficult thing to do we have to keep aware and, and i love taking it on so that's all <laughs> i can say uh, well, my hr I, people know that i'm 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 quite good to discuss with on these matters and i'll i'll give them a few challenges i think i think sarah you being a triathlete probably helps you with this uh constant <laughs> this constant dialogue look uh, let me a question came in around seeing is believing and you've already mentioned i think both of you mentioned it about the presence of of, of a woman or of a different gender in a in a class can make a difference and we saw this when obama became president all of a sudden lots of angels individuals who were not white all of a sudden believed that they could also stand on that on that lectern so what can we be doing or should we be doing with this seeing is believing and really how do, how do we change this you know how, how what can we be doing with this yeah. so it, it's of course ideal if you have you know a, a real person in the classroom but uh we should also take a step back and just think about everything in our environment. Mm -hmm. And so at Harvard, I'm you know, ashamed to say, it's only about now 14 years ago that a colleague of mine, uh, Jane Mansbridge, uh, realized that at Kennedy School, of the 50 portraits on our walls um, uh, depicting leaders, exactly zero were of a female leader. Wow. And here we are a school with 50% um, uh, women students and I can attest that we weren't intentionally out there to signal to our female students that they're not made to be leaders. And still, yeah. we have this wall, not just one wall, we have lots of walls um, surrounding them with uh, male presidents, male prime ministers, you know, uh, other, other leaders. And so we've changed that. So we now have Ellen Johnson Sirleaf um, on our wall. She's also a graduate of the school and just, just many more diverse um, uh, uh, leaders. Mm -hmm. And that's where it starts. So I think raising awareness can be realizing. And that's another thing, by the way, that her audience can start doing this afternoon or tomorrow morning when you go back to your, um, or maybe not tomorrow morning. I know many of you are working remotely, but when you go back <laughs> to your offices, um, I mean, 
take a look, be vigilant about what uh, we are showing. Uh, there's good research in psychology that um, sometimes is called the stereotype threat. And in fact, I'm, I'm actually gonna tell you that the research just very quickly, it came out of MIT initially, where they tested young Asian girls uh, on math performance. I think it's gonna resonate with the ATI, in particular with the um, topics that Sarah talked about before, where they um, either reminded them, so these, these are young girls, eight-year-olds, uh, they reminded them either of their Asian identity or their mm -hmm. identity as That's being a woman. And right, and sadly, that affected their performance in the math test because oh, stereotypically, stereotypically yeah. in the US, Asianness is associated with brilliance in math. And being a female at the time, sadly, was associated with mm -hmm. um, having a hard time in math. And so, again, the posters, even in our classrooms, are we, you know, having Star Wars, mm -hmm. very male type mm -hmm. um, images in our surroundings? Or do we, um, in fact, communicate that this is an inclusive environment where everyone can thrive? This is exactly what I say all the time to our Hochschule Kommunikation, and they, they, they're they pretty good, actually, but every now and then they have to be reminded. And it's one of the things I look for, again, from my triathlon training from all of those all of those years, year, years, years ago. So I think um, this is a absolutely, um, this is absolutely crucial. Definitely needs to be done. So one of the things, another, this is along the idea of one of the other questions which came in, which was, if you're in a team, what are, what are one of the two, a few of the words which we might be using, myself included, what are some of the words which I might use unknowingly or, or that, that you would say, hey, you need to really be checking that these are the two or three words which you really are trying to either incorporate or unincorporate from the way we work in our teams when it comes to the gender equality. Well, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. I did this when really we did this yeah. or, or, or X, Y, Z, uh, Katarina did this or whatever. So well, I think one of the things that's really important for us is to give credit where credit is due and, yeah. um, and to be very inclusive and generous because we are the bosses and we're mm -hmm. the people who are seen. We absolutely need to lift up the people around us. And, and we need to get them also to lift up the people around them. So it's this generosity of spirit. This pandemic is horrible. It's absolutely been awful to so many people. We need to find a way to come out of this very toxic environment where we're not shaking hands, where we're you know really holding back to be able to come together, work together. And I love the word together. Everybody's always bored when I say this because ETH is in the middle of together, but you know, really find that way through in a positive sense so that we can be inclusive and, uh, and generous. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with everything you said, Sarah. And um, any people interested can just you know, Google gendered words and they will find a long library of gendered words. And it's actually not rocket science to even imagine what could be gendered? Go back to your stereotypes. You know, what types, and again, these are stereotypes, right? Often not true, but it's the kinds of things we associate with men and women respectively. And then, you know, words such as collaboration, cooperation, very much along the lines of what Sarah just described, kind of come up as stereotypically being associated yeah. with women. Um, and other words such as competitiveness or assertiveness hmm. uh, tend to come up uh, when we uh, uh, think about men. And these are the types of words that you can use to either shape a more inclusive environment or not. Um, and ideally, yeah. you know, maybe try to even avoid some of them just altogether, because I think the goal is not in any case <laughs> to exclude men. The goal is to level the playing field for everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So someone has asked what, in addition, of course, to your book, Iris, which everyone should get and peruse and read and memorize, is there another book or article, website, so as we say, okay, here, everybody on this call, all, we have over 200 people. Uh, we should all go and read this. What would, is there one or two you would suggest? And also to you, Sarah, if you have one to share with us too, but I know Iris, this is something you really- Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let me give you maybe two ideas and both will be a little self-centered, not 
on me, but okay. the world that I uh, live in. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is, so one book is called The Conversation. It is uh, just came out a month ago from Robert Livingston. And it applies many of the same types of insights that I've been sharing today on gender equality to race. So if you're interested in race and want to think about what to do to create a more inclusive work environment, check out the book, Robert Livingston, um, The Conversation. If you're interested in learning more about gender equality and what works, uh, go to our gender action portal. It's GAP, Uh, it's a different GAP than the GAP that you might think of. So gender action portal, where what we try to do is we summarize research for practitioners. So I think one of the mandates that I see um, academia having is making the research accessible to the uh, end users. And that's what we're trying to do with that portal, kind of summarizing what, what um, researchers have found, what works and what doesn't work, as I said before, Chris, uh, on economic participation, health, education, and political opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Sarah, do you have one to add to that? Or? Oh, I, I, I mean, I think uh, there's, there's lots of things you can, you can read. I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying um, reading, um, reading uh, about outliers, about uh, judgment, um, so thin slicing judgment. They're not so much gender um, mm-hmm. and about, um, about practice, deliberate practice. And, um, and, and, and but less really about the gender on the gender side, I must say. Yeah. Although my new role at St. Hilda's College has a very strong feminist tradition there. So I'm going to be going from here, where we were less than 10% professors, to St. Hilda's, where over two thirds of the fellows are female. And uh, the tradition of radical feminism was really strong uh, then. And they only took in men 17 years ago. So I'm sort of flipping in a sense. It, it will be interesting. Mm. That's fantastic. Well, and congratulations on your new role. Sorry, you're, I'm sorry we're sorry you're leaving, but congratulations on the new one. Um, the two books have come in: "Invisible Women" and "Anything" by Caroline Criado Perez. Yeah, it... she's great. Okay, yeah. there you go. So I just I was on the call. I was. Uh, she's actually writing a second book. So. Check, look out for her. She recently interviewed me her, uh, for her second book and is hard at work hiding uh, to write more on that. Yes, That's really wonderful. important. Thank book. you. So that comes in from our, from our, our listeners. Uh, so I'll just repeat those, Invisible Women or, and or books by Caroline Criado Perez. So I unfortunately have to bring our conversation to a close. Our hour has gone by in seems like an, a, a blink of an eye. And um, I, I want to personally thank you on behalf of the ETH and our community and our listeners for making the time to share your passion, your dedication, and you know your, your openness with us this afternoon, this morning, this evening, depending on where you're in the world. It has really been a joy for me and thank you. I look forward to becoming a micro sponsor every day. And I will try hard, hard. I know I will fail at times, but I will try to do that. And I hope everyone does. I think that's a wonderful idea. So um, thank you, Sarah. And can I have a this. can I have a last comment? Actually, I've just seen that <laughs> emeritus professor <laughs> Sylvia Dawn has put in the book recommendation from Anna Gary, inspiring conversations with women professors, the many routes to career success from Elsevier. And I should, of course, immediately have thought of that. I apologize, Anna. Um, and, and that's a really excellent recommendation as well. And I would just like to wish roses to everybody on this special day as well. So thank you very much, Chris. Yeah. You deserve a rose as well. Uh, maybe I'll give you a pink one to you rather than a red one, but uh, there we go. I'll and it's take been lovely to meet. It's been lovely to meet you, Iris, as well. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for having me, Sarah and Chris. Thank you both. And to our audience, thank you so much for choosing to spend this time with us on this really especially important day. And our next global lecture will be on Thursday, the 22nd of April. And we'll see you then. Thank you so much. All the best to you. Stay safe. Drink lots of water, eat apples, and run every day.